Chapter 3. The Wizard. The last remnants of the Dig group were beginning to call themselves the Losers Club, resembling forlorn characters out of a Stephen King novel. They had squared off against a labyrinthine evil so incomprehensible, they didn't know what they were fighting. It was time to bring in some outside help. During a strategy meeting in Jackson, California, Ben Wagner had received an impressive 700-page report commissioned by the Tula City Council. The report, compiled by Ted Gunderson, a former Los Angeles FBI agent, was in-depth and straightforward about deputies receiving payoffs and distributing drugs in the small farm town of Tula. Wagner had given me a copy for my files. On an impulse, I picked up the phone and called Gunderson's telephone number listed at the top of the attached resume. He'd worked as SAC, senior special agent in charge, at Los Angeles FBI headquarters, Washington, D.C. headquarters and in Dallas, Texas. It would be two years before I would grasp the significance of the Dallas connection. After retiring from the FBI, he'd worked for F. Lee Bailey, a squire, then formed his own investigative agency in Los Angeles County. I left a message with the answering service and he returned the call a few days later. His voice was open, attentive, devoid of the bureaucratic hollowness I had come to expect from FBI agents. We talked briefly, mostly about the problem Dick was experiencing in Mariposa. I said I needed help, anticipating his next question. But none came forth. Instead, a clipped knowingness entered his tone, as if nothing more should be said on the phone. He agreed to meet with me at his home a few weeks later and we hung up. Unknown to me at the time, I had taken a quantum leap in the direction of the octopus when I contacted Ted Gunderson. The mystery of the Mariposa cover-ups would soon be divulged through an associate of his, a former member of the company in nearby Fresno, California. On November 30, 1991, Ted Gunderson opened the door at his Manhattan Beach home and ushered us into a small living room cluttered with toys. He made no explanation for the toys scattered around the floor and the couch, but offered coffee and donuts, then proceeded to eat most of the donuts himself. I had expected someone dripping with intrigue, instead he was classic in the sense of an investigator. Rumpled shirt and slacks, nervous movements, distracted behavior. We sat on the couch bunched together amongst the toys. Gunderson pulled a kitchen chair up in front of us, leaned over and began stuffing his mouth with cheese and crackers, all the while talking, his body in perpetual motion. He was a big, handsome man with an aging face and tousled silver hair. He seemed entirely unaware of his appearance or the appearance of his home, but his pale eyes were intelligent and probing. Intuitively, I knew he was more than he appeared to be. Ray Jenkins recounted the Mariposa story for several hours, with my husband and I digressing to insert a fact here or there. The investigation had led beyond Mariposa into MCA Incorporated, and various state and federal levels of government. I noted that Danny Casalaro's research had started at the eastern end, in Washington, D.C., yet he had been preparing to travel to California for the rest of the story, before his highly publicized death in August. Three months passed. Gunderson listened carefully, occasionally interrupting to ask questions, then motioned us to follow him to the backyard. There we stood in a circle in the middle of his yard while he surveyed the area. Satisfied that he was not being surveillanced, he agreed to come to Mariposa, with media, and perform a citizen's arrest on the corrupt officials. He pulled a frazzled piece of paper from his pocket and gave me a list of telephone numbers to write down. They were numbers to telephone booths at various locations in the vicinity of his home. Each booth had been coded 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. He instructed that the next time I called him, he would give me the code number of the booth and a time to call. I would then call him at the designated booth. Eight hours later, I handed him a copy of my first book, as a courtesy, then left Manhattan Beach loaded with newspaper clippings and documents mostly relating to Casalaro's investigation of the octopus. One packet was titled, The Wonderful Weapons of Wokenet, others related to the Inslaw Affair, Iran-Contra and various savings and loan scandals. In the van, reviewing the documents, I wondered what relationship they had to Mariposa County and why I was given the packet. 
the documents were far-ranging, beyond anything I had heretofore imagined. But within days of my visit to Gunderson, I would be introduced to the octopus. The following morning, December 1, 1991, at 7.30 a.m., I received a collect call from a man who identified himself as Michael Reconosciuto, calling from the Pierce County Jail in Tacoma, Washington. He had been informed by Gunderson that I was investigating a corruption-slash-drug ring in Mariposa County. For 45 minutes Reconosciuto related the names of those in charge of methamphetamine operations in Mariposa, Madera and Fresno counties. A ton of methamphetamine had been seized in the area of my investigations, according to Reconosciuto. Richard Nozzi was a high-level cooker and Jim De Silva, Ben Kalker, and others were medium-level distributors or lieutenants. Kalker was currently serving time in a Pleasanton prison. 900 pounds of methamphetamine had been seized under his control. Who's behind this ring? I asked. Reconosciuto paused for a moment, then took a deep breath. It's the company. Arms get shipped to the Contras, the Afghanistan rebels, Mujahedin, the Middle East. You know, to fight the Soviet influence. But the Contras and the Mujahedin don't have money to pay for arms, so they pay with drugs, cocaine or heroin. The company handles the drug end of it in the U.S. What's the company? I asked. Reconosciuto interrupted, wait a minute. It's a long story. You have to start at the beginning. Concerned that Reconosciuto might have to hang up, I hurriedly pushed for answers. Arms for drugs, do you have proof? Oh, yeah. It's a self-supporting system, they don't have to go through Congress. Michael, I pressed who ships the arms. Reconosciuto quieted for a moment, gathering his thoughts. Let's start with Wokenet. I didn't play ball with Wokenet so they poisoned the well for me. I'm in jail because I worked for Wokenet. The government has put together a very simple drug case against me. As if that's what I'm about, just a druggie. Tell me about Wokenet. It's a security corporation headquartered in Coral Gables, Florida. Wokenet provides security for the Nevada nuclear test site, the Alaskan pipeline, Lawrence Livermore Labs, you know, all the high-security government facilities in the U.S. They have about 50,000 armed security guards that work for minimum wage or slightly above. On the other hand, on the Wokenet board of directors, they have all the former heads of every government agency there ever was under Ronald Reagan and George Bush. FBI, CIA, NSA Secret Service, etc. You know, they've got retired Admiral Stansfield Turner, a former CIA director. Clarence Kelly, former FBI director. Frank Carlucci, former CIA deputy director. James Rowley, former Secret Service director. Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, former acting chairman of President Bush's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board and former CIA deputy director. Before his appointment as Reagan's CIA director, the late William Casey was Wokenet's outside legal counsel. I interrupted him, wanting to know where he fit into the picture. Well, I served as director of research for the Wokenet facility at the Cabazon Indian Reservation in Indio, California. Indiana, 1983-84 I modified the Promise computer software to be used in law enforcement and intelligence agencies worldwide. A man named Earl Bryan was spearheading a plan for worldwide use of the software, but essentially, the modified software was being pirated from the owners, Bill and Nancy Hamilton. I asked, so how did that cause your arrest? Michael was articulate, but his story was becoming complicated. He continued. I signed an affidavit for the Hamilton stating that I had been responsible for the modification. The House Judiciary Committee on Inslaw was investigating the theft of the software and I was afraid I would be implicated since I had performed the modification. Eight days later, in an attempt to discredit my testimony, I was arrested for allegedly operating a drug lab. I didn't want to push Reconosciuto on the subject of a drug lab at that point, but voiced my foremost concern. Will the House Judiciary Committee be bringing you in to testify? Eventually, yes. Are you in any danger where you are right now? 
I was unaware at the time that Reconosciuto had been recruited at Stanford University into the CIA nearly twenty years earlier, and danger was a matter of fact in his life. Oh, you bet. Several of the jail guards here moonlight for Wachenet here in Tacoma. Reconosciuto went on to discuss the Wachenet setup. Basically, what you have is a group of politically well-connected people through Wachenet who wanted to get juicy defense contracts when Ronald Reagan got elected president. And they did. They also preyed on high-tech startup companies, many of them out of Silicon Valley in California. They saw technology that they wanted and they either forced the companies into bankruptcy or waited on the sidelines, like vultures, and picked them up for pennies after they were bankrupt. I made profuse notes as Reconosciuto spoke, not knowing where he was leading, but assuming his narrative would eventually intersect with my investigation of government-sanctioned drug operations. Finally it did. According to Reconosciuto, people at Wachenet Corporation made inroads into the methamphetamine operation. A man named, withheld allegedly headed major government-sanctioned meth laboratories in Fresno, Madera and Mariposa counties. A man named, withheld, a former Israeli intelligence officer with U.S. citizenship, was the liaison or connection between the, withheld operation and the U.S. government. In subsequent documents obtained from Michael's secret hiding place in the California desert, I located documents which indicated Michael had first been recruited into government operations by Al Holbert. However, during this first of many phone conversations with Reconosciuto, I found myself searching for a beginning, something concrete to get a foothold. Michael, is there any proof that you worked at Wachenet? Michael responded diffidently. CNN recently ran a piece, and they filmed a location shot from the parking lot of the casino. Then they aired another location shot on the Cabazon Reservation of just an expanse of bare land, blue sky, sand and sagebrush. Then the narrator says, here on the Indian Reservation is where Michael Reconosciuto claims to have modified the Promise software. They didn't show the tribal office complex, they didn't show the industrial park. They showed a bare expanse of land, like I had a computer out in a teepee in the middle of the desert. The government is doing a character assassination on me. I'm fair game now that I'm in jail, because I've raised too many provocative questions, you know, and they're trying to relegate me to the area of delusion. For three months Reconosciuto called daily from the Pierce County Jail in Tacoma, Washington. At his request, I attached a tape recorder to my phone and unraveled a complicated web of illegal overseas arms shipments, espionage, CIA drug trafficking, biological warfare development, computer software theft, money laundering and corruption at the highest levels of government. Throughout this time span, I also obtained every newspaper and magazine article I could lay my hands on relative to Reconosciuto's background and contacts. Reconosciuto had been a child prodigy at the age of 10, when he wired his parents' neighborhood with a working, private telephone system that undercut Mar Bell. As a teenager, he had won so many science fairs with exhibits of laser technology that he was invited to be a summer research assistant at Stanford's, University prestigious Cooper Vapor Laser Laboratory. Dr. Arthur Shallow, a Nobel laureate, remembered him, you don't forget a 16-year-old youngster who shows up with his own argon laser, he told Danny Casalaro, a Washington, D.C. journalist. Casalaro began interviewing Reconosciuto prior to his arrest on March 29, 1991. The patient, amenable wizard with the dark, weary eyes, opened a window for Danny into a netherworld of real-life players in Dungeons and Dragons, where scientific genius is employed in nefarious activities, and spooks jump on and off the board at will. On August 10, 1991, Danny's nude body was found in the bathtub of room 517 of the Sheraton Hotel in Martinsburg, West Virginia. His wrists had been slashed 10 or 12 times. No papers were found in his hotel room or in his car though he was known to cart an accordion file everywhere he went. An ex-acto blade found in the bathtub was not sold locally and his accordion file is still missing to this day. Casalaro was working on a book entitled, Behold, A Pale Horse, which encompassed the October Surprise Story, the Insular Computer Software Case, the Iran-Contra Affair, the BCCI Scandal, and MCA. Entertainment Corporation 
all overlapping and interconnecting into one network which he dubbed, the Octopus. He told friends that he had traced the Inslaw and related stories back to a dirty CIA old boy network that had begun working together in the 1950s around the Albania covert operations. These men had gotten into the illegal gun and drug trade back then and had continued in that business ever since. Before his death, Danny had made plans to visit the Wakenet Corporation in Indio, California, and even considered naming his book, Indio. Through an investigator in Indio I was able to obtain a copy of a letter written on Wakenet letterhead by Patrick F. Canan, director of Wakenet Corporate Relations, dated January 31, 1992 which confirmed Reconosciuto's scientific value and involvement with Wakenet. A joint venture agreement between the Cabazan Band of Mission Indians and Wakenet Corporation was formalized on April 1, 1981 by a prestigious Washington, D.C. law firm headed by ex-Senator James Aboresk and his associate, Glenn M. Feldman, representing the Cabazans. The main purpose of the joint venture was to establish a production facility, called Cabazan Arms, on the one square mile of Cabazan owned desert land near Indio. One excerpt from the 11 page letter referred to a meeting in May 1981 at the U.S. Army installation at Dover, New Jersey between Robert Fry, Vice President of Wakenet and Indio, Michael Reconosciuto, John P. Nichols, Cabazan Administrator, Peter Zokoski, former President of Armed C in Indio, which produced combustible cartridge cases for the Army and Dr. Harry Fair, the Army's lead engineer on the railgun project at Pickett in the Arsenal. Canan noted that Reconosciuto and several Army personnel conducted an extensive and highly technical theoretical blackboard exercise on the railgun, and afterwards, Dr. Fair commented that he was extremely impressed with Reconosciuto's scientific and technical knowledge in this matter. Canan further wrote, Dr. Fair had apparently been apprised by Nichols that Reconosciuto had been convicted and served time for stabbing a DEA agent whom he purportedly caught in bed with Reconosciuto's wife. Dr. Fair had commented that Reconosciuto would probably not be able to ever get a government security clearance because of his past, but it would be a shame if Reconosciuto, whom he termed a potential national resource, could not be used for military research projects in his field of expertise. The Wakenet Cabazan joint venture was terminated on October 1, 1984, after Robert Fry suffered a heart attack. What transpired at the Cabazan Indian Reservation while the joint venture was in effect subsequently became the subject of investigations by the U.S. Department of Justice, the House Judiciary Committee on Inslaw, U.S. Customs, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, police agencies, and media worldwide.